I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heads with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. In your hymnal 405, a friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong and true. It's just like his great love. Let's all stand together as we sing 405 together on that first. A friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong and true. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful day you've given to us. God, we thank you for just being such a blessing to us. Lord, I thank you for the uh, precious promises that we receive from your word. Thank you for the uh, uh, fantastic fellowship we have with one another. And God, we just are, are so grateful for all that you do for us. I pray that you would just take control of this service right now. Lord, use it. 
uh, as you would see fit. God, we're just so grateful that we have this opportunity to come together in one place here and, and hear your word and sing songs that uh, uh, magnify you. And Lord, I just pray that this whole evening would make you look good. We're just so grateful for it. In Jesus' precious and holy name I do pray, amen. You may be seated. 341 in your hymnal, 341. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory. Let's sing that first together. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary. kick this up a notch just a hair here uh in uh every week when we go into the prison we sing uh victory in jesus and it's a it's a powerful powerful thing to hear you know 40 to 90 guys singing victory in jesus but then even there we kind of sing it what we call ru style and i like us to do that tonight when you uh, we come to the chorus and it says he sought me and he bought me when we say he bought me then just holler out as loud as you can sold with his redeeming blood, praise God. All right? Let's, uh, let's do that second verse together. And when we get that to that chorus, just, uh, just let her rip. All right? On that second together. I heard about his visiting of his cleansing We have a few announcements for we need to look at. <coughs> um, 
lots happening this week. If you go to the inside there, we have, um, on Saturday, we have the men's uh, breakfast. Uh, we have a, a great time there. Uh, men, uh, sign up down uh, downstairs. There's $3 a uh, person. Best $3 breakfast you'll get anywhere. Uh, eggs, bacon, sausage biscuit, uh, sausage gravy and biscuits, um, fried potatoes, uh, milk, uh, chocolate milk and orange juice and coffee and you can't get that anywhere else. You can't even do that at TJ's for uh, three bucks. You couldn't even do that at Ohio Deli for three bucks. <coughs> um, but uh, so uh, men, why don't you come on out? I know uh, a lot of ladies get jealous of our uh, men's breakfast. Um, but uh, uh, guys, if you'll sign up there, that'd be great. Uh, ladies, you do have opportunity to uh, have a you have a high tea. It's a um, it's a mother daughter uh, luncheon is what it is. It's uh, just renamed this year as the ladies high tea. Uh, it is seven dollars uh, a person there. You'll want to be at this um, event, ladies. It's just uh, it's going to be beautiful. The the auditorium will be totally transformed to uh, look like a fine dining area. And um, it's, it's going to be a, a gorgeous, a gorgeous thing. Um, and you'll have good food, too. Uh, but uh, it'll, be, it'll be a great night. I uh, have a, a great speaker. Um, and uh, just uh, make sure and sign up uh, afterwards. There'll be somebody down in the lobby to uh, sign up there. Um, and then uh, we do have coming up soon, be praying for the uh, country fair, our eighth annual country fair. It will be on Saturday this year. Uh, Saturday the 16th, so the 2nd through the 15th is our operation saturation. Be uh, prepared to um, uh, be prepared to um, be at work that uh, week. And uh, we have about 20,000 flyers need to be uh, given out. And just looking forward to a fantastic, fantastic time. Um, of course, we do have um, uh, Are You Inside on Thursday. And that's our, um, the are you at the prison? Uh, just looking forward to doing that every week. And uh, be praying. It looks like uh, we're going to be go going into the London prison as well very, very soon. So that's uh, just going to be another outreach that we can uh, do there. And uh, just looking forward to that. And then, um, of course, on Friday night, we have are you uh, right here at 7 o'clock every, uh, every Friday evening. Um, let's see. Uh, Look around, see if we have any visitors. Do we have any visitors, first-time visitors, or maybe first time in a long time? I don't think we do. So without uh, any further ado, let's hear from the choir. <coughs>
150 in your hymnal. 150. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. 150. He lives. Let's sing that first together. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives. Salvation to over to 275, 275, when peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea bellows roll. Let's all stand one more time, if you would. It is well on that first together. When peace like a Let this blessed us 
another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing those last stanzas together. chorus with me now. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Now this third verse of it is well. It just gives me goosebumps when I sing it. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. It's nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Let's sing that third together and sing it like you mean it. My sin, oh, the bliss.
ushers come forward. We'll take up our evening offering. <coughs> Looking forward to what God's going to do with this, uh, this bus. And uh, he is... Uh, he has proven himself over and over again, and we're looking forward to him proving himself again. Um, we uh, have a total of $973 have come in, and that includes about 478 today. And so we need at least another 500 today. Um, we have a $1,000 match out there that is um, uh, being offered. Uh, everything dollar for dollar, dollar up to a thousand dollars, and so uh, we'd like to take full advantage of that. And so I um, uh, need at least another five hundred dollars tonight. If uh, the Lord uh, puts on your heart to add another zero to that, that's all right too. But um, we're looking forward to seeing what God's going to do um, when it comes to the bus. Be praying for our pastor as well. He is uh, he will be uh, traveling in uh, tomorrow uh, to head back here, and. Um, but uh, be praying uh, for him. There's a lot of uh, other needs uh, here in the church um, that uh, just uh, remember in prayer as well. Uh, Brother Lemke, won't you pray for the offering, would you please? Dear Lord, I thank you and praise you for this time to come out tonight. You know that there's many needs and burdens in this church. God, we do lift up the uh, bus route. We pray, God, that you would just bless. Lord, I know that we've had some really good days, yeah. but it's a tight ride. So, God, I pray you just help us to do right. Help us to love and serve you. And, God, I pray you just be with us. Lord, I pray you bless the pastor as he's in Kentucky. Give him safe travels. He comes back. And, Lord, I pray you prepare our hearts for the message tonight. In Jesus' name. to have uh, Pastor Dutton. He is um, at your local now, pretty much. Um, <coughs> but uh, he was, he's was he been a pastor for uh, 30 years, evangelist for uh, 12, said he's married 45 and preaching for almost 50. And uh, he's had uh, a church in Texas and Mansfield, Ohio, and um, just a uh, uh, understand he's uh, pretty all around good guy according to Abram. Uh, so, um, but uh, we're looking forward to hearing Pastor Dutton here uh, momentarily. Uh, we'll have uh, Tanya come and uh, bring a special, and then as soon as she's finished, take the reins, brother.
and I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to him. From care he sets me free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I'm delighted to be here tonight. How many's glad you're here? It's good. I've heard so many good things about your church, and it's just a joy to be here in a beautiful auditorium, and boy, I enjoyed that singing. That was tremendous. I travel to about 40, 45 churches a year, and uh, always get a little nervous the first time I get to come to a church, and this is my first time I've got to speak here, but I am happy to be here, and it's good to meet you folks. I have been preaching not hardly 50 years. I got to thinking about that, and I've been married 45 years in 20 days and officially preaching 45, and I've been teaching about 48. But uh, it's a joy to be with you folks and to be able to share with you the Word of God. We're living in a time when we need to keep our eyes up on the Savior. The Bible said, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And that's what I want to talk about tonight here in just a few moments. But um, it's good to have my wife, Terry, with me. We've been married in 20 days, 45 years. For 30 years, she was a blonde. And then she got cancer and lost all of her hair. And they said, it's going to come back in a different color. And it did. It came back in real, real dark. And she said, how do you like it? I said, I love it. I was kind of hoping for a redhead this time around, though. <laughs> But um, she said, will you love me when I'm old and gray? I said, I guess I've loved you through three shades already. <laughs> Terry's a school teacher and kind of reminds me of a school teacher that stood up in a first grade class, and she asked a very unusual question. She said, does anybody think you're ugly? And a little boy, first grade, stood up. She said, honey, you don't think you're ugly, do you? He said, no, but I didn't want you standing up there by yourself. <laughs> but... Um, I'm, I'm just glad to be here, and uh, I, I want to uh, bring a message tonight on, you know, times has changed a whole lot from when I started, and in my daddy's day and in my day, there were no pantyhose, no drip dry clothes, no ice makers, no dishwashers, no credit cards, no TVs, no computers, no iPads or iPods, thank God, no cell phones or texting. In my day, a chip meant a piece of wood. A Coke was what we drank pot was something we cooked in. Grass was what we mowed. Hardware was a store. And uh, software wasn't even a word. Hard drive was a trip from Virginia all the way to Ohio. The cell phone was the last call you made from the Clintwood jailhouse. A mouse was caught in a trap. Five and ten cent stores where you could actually buy things for five and ten cents. Stamps could be, uh, was three cents for a first class stamp. And uh, gasoline was 29 cents a gallon in my day and 19 cents a gallon in my dad's day. 
We had pie suppers, square dances, picnics, swings on the front porch. We had old-time revivals. And somebody said, today our phones are wireless, our cooking is fireless, our cars are keyless, our tires are tubeless, our youth are jobless, our attitude is careless, our feelings are heartless, our children are mannerless, and the Congress, <coughs> they're not doing good either. <laughs> and that leaves me speechless. The Bible said this, know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, when men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, uh, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, despiser, tready, 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 heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The Bible said in 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter in the first verse, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath given to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. And the Bible also said because pernicious times will come or evil times men will follow their pernicious or deadly ways by reason of whom the way of truth is evil spoken of. Uh, last week in our Columbus Dispatch newspaper, somebody wrote an article about the, pe the Bible being an antiquated old book written by people that didn't know about the modern times in which we're living. Let me say something. These times haven't caught God off guard. He's still on His throne. He still knows what we need before we ask. He knows the ending from the beginning. He knows our downsetting and our uprising. He knows our thoughts are far off. He understands what we need. And I'll tell you something tonight, folks. We need an old-time revival in America, turning back to holiness and turning back to God and letting God be God and, and uh, just enjoying His blessing. He's still in the business of saving. Amen. I preached a sermon the other night not too far from here, and there was a couple that came in. And the gentleman was a little unusual. He had tattoos up both arms, tattooed, I think they were lightning bolts on his neck. His head was shaved, and he had tattoos all over his head. And I looked on the back of his head, and he had a face tattooed on the back of his head. I didn't know if he's coming or going. <laughs> this is on Wednesday night. And when I got through preaching, I went back to the back there, and somebody came back and grabbed a hold of me and said, Brother Dutton, they want to talk to a preacher up there. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I wonder what I've said. And uh, I got up there, and the lady was crying. I said, you want to get saved? She said, I certainly do. And I led her to Christ right there in the seat. I put my arm on his shoulder, and I said, sir, you need to think about this too right now. And he said, I am thinking about it. The gospel can get to people and save them. Amen. We need the gospel message proclaimed. We need to tell the, the, the old news, the good news, the glorious news of a Savior, of a, of a loving Savior. Moses said, show me thy glory. And uh, he saw him in the burning bush. Stephen saw him when he was being stoned. Jacob saw him when he wrestled with the angel. The Hebrew children saw him in the burning fiery furnace. Daniel saw him in the lion's den. Uh, Peter saw him on the mountain of transfiguration. And notice his testimony. He didn't say, really, I walked on water, I got out of prison one night. But he said, We've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the coming of our Lord, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw him with our own eyes. And in 1 John, the Bible said, That which was from the beginning, which we have seen, which we have heard, which our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which was from the beginning declare we unto you. The Bible tells us that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was not the true light, but was sent to bear witness of the true light, the light that shineth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, but the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. 
But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name, which were born not of the blood, nor of the flesh, nor but of, the will of, of, of God. And the Bible said, listen to this, And the word was made flesh, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let me say to you tonight, we need to see the glory of God. We need to get a glimpse of Jesus. Uh, we've got all the programs and the plans and things like that going on. We just need to get back to seeing the glory of God and what God intended for us by His loving grace. I was in Vietnam in 1965 and 66, and I, I come so close to getting killed one day, I missed my flight. The helicopter went out and crashed, and several men was killed. The pilot and the, co and the crew chief was killed, and God had His hand upon me. And he let me get home. And I remember when I got home, I went to an old country church. I don't remember what the preacher said. I just remember that he beat on the pulpit. He spit on the first four or five rows. He said, you're going to go to hell if you don't get right with God. And I thought I was before he would quit preaching. But when he finally quit preaching, let me tell you what happened. I went down to the altar, and God, for Christ's sake, forgave me of my sins. And I got up, and the family said it wouldn't last, but it's been 40-some years, and it's getting better all the time. Hallelujah. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. The Bible said concerning the glory of God, let me just get this out of the way here, and then I'll get on into the message in just a moment. Um, in the 35th chapter of the book of Isaiah, the wilderness and the solitary places shall be glad for him, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly in glory with joy and singing, and the, glo and the glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Say unto them that are of weak hands, Be strong, be behold, your God cometh with vengeance. Even God, he will come and save you. And the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. And the Bible said, The lame man will leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. We're talking about the glory of God here. God said it's going to happen, and a highway will be there. And a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring man, though a fool should not err therein. And the glory of the Lord shall return to Zion with joy and singing and everlasting song. I can't wait till that happens. When God in His grace, I tell you, we look in this book and you know what we see? We see the Lord Jesus Christ. We see Him in the Old Testament in prophecy. We find Him in pictures. We see Him in parables. We hear Him in person. We listen to Him in preaching. We experience Him in the power of His great salvation. And we're going to live forever because of the promise of eternal life uh, that He gave us. He never struck a jarring note. He never made a misstep. He never faltered along life's journey. He was the perfect, sinless Son of God. Uh, he's greater than any man that ever lived. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He lived before he was born. He lived after he died. He's the blessed Son of God that never made a mistake. Amen? Thank God for Jesus, the Savior. One old preacher was preaching, and he asked a, sort of a rhetorical question. Yeah, those are the type that you know the audience is not supposed to answer. He just asked it to answer it himself. He said, matter of fact, nobody down here is perfect. He said, do you all know of anybody that's perfect? And to his surprise, a woman held her hand up in the audience. He said, do you know somebody that's perfect? She said, no, I don't know her, but I've heard a lot about her. It's my husband's first wife. <laughs> the fact is, we, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we need the grace and the forgiveness of God. Thank God for his mercy. Where do we see the glory of God? First of all, we do not see it in a modernistic church. Amen. They're changing things today, folks. You know, uh, people are questioning the authority of the Word of God. Let me say right here, I believe the Bible is inspired, inerrant, infallible. It's true from beginning to the end. Amen. I debated the evolutionist over at the Ohio State University. They asked me to come over there. The first thing I said is, I want you folks to know one thing. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. And I do. And it'll stand up under any scrutiny. The Holy Scriptures. Let me say that we do not see God's glory in the modernist church. We do not see it in a dead church. I've been in a lot of churches that, that is dead. I went in the First Baptist Church of Providence, Rhode Island. 
and it's the first Baptist church that's ever built in America. I, I got there early because I said I probably won't be able to get a seat. There was only about 35 or 40 people there. And when I said the sexton set me down in a seat and he locked a little door there beside me, and, and there I was in there, and the lady that sang, she was in the balcony, and the preacher was as modern as anybody you've ever seen. And I got to, I thought, well, I'll ease over here close to these folks and maybe look on their songbook. And they kept looking at me and moving over till I had them all the way to the end like this. <laughs> Scared them to death. Finally, you know what I did? I opened the little door and got out and just got around and started shaking hands with everybody. And all them visitors looked at me and they seen me doing that and they thought that's what you're supposed to do and all the whole audience started doing that. And the preacher said, oh, it's got out of hand here. Let me say we don't see the glory of God in a dead church nor in a contemporary hippie church. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Amen. There's several places we see the glory of God. Number one, we see the glory of God at the cradle. 2,000 years ago, God came and visited us. He was personified in human form. In the cradle, we see the beauty of God's holiness. We see the reality of God's love. We see the majesty of God's power. We see the authority of God's throne. He alone was virgin born. He lived a, uh, a vicarious life or a virtuous life. He died a vicarious death. He was victoriously raised from the dead, and he'll visibly return again. The supernatural hovered over his cradle and fluttered his wings all the days of his life. A way had to be made for man to be reconciled unto God. The Bible said, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the spirit of disobedience that now worketh in the children of disobedience. But now, thank God in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath broken down the middle wall of partition, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make of himself one new man and so making peace. Thank God we are no more foreigners, we're no more strangers, but now we're children of God and build upon the foundation of the holy apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. If you're looking for a place to say amen, you can jump in anywhere. <laughs> amen. Jesus is the Savior. I do woodwork, and uh, I do some things for different people. And the judge downtown, I was on jury duty, so I made gavels for the judges downtown. And one day, the judge asked me to do some work for him. And uh, he said, I'm going to come up to your house and pick it up. And he didn't come that day. He called me instead, and he said, Reverend, I, uh, I'm unable to come today. He said, uh, I'll have to come another day. I said, Your Honor, how about if I come down there and I'd like to see where your judge's chamber's at? He said, I'm not in the chamber. I'm in court. But he said, if you will come down, Reverend Dutton, he said, just tell the bailiff. that Just tell the bailiff. He'll tell me, and everything will be taken care of. So I went down to the uh, Franklin County Courthouse that day, and when I got there, it was a building about the size of this building. It was packed full. There were people going and coming. There were prosecuting attorneys, defense attorneys. There were criminals. And boy, that thing was going on. And the judge was sitting at his uh, bench. And you know what he was doing? He's putting most of them in jail that day. They'd come up there and stand before him. And he'd say, uh, 30 days. And boy, they'd take that fellow off. And another fellow came up there. And he, didn't, he wasn't dressed very well at all. And... Um, the judge looked at him and said, Sir, is that the best clothes you have? He said, No. He said, Then you go home and get some better clothes on, and you come back tomorrow. And he said, If you don't have any better clothes on, I'll put you in jail. And I thought, Oh, my goodness. I went over and told the bailiff. I said, uh, Tell the judge that Freddie Dutton is here. And you know what the judge did? He stood up, and he stopped everything in that court procedures, and he looked back at the back. I was on this side, and he said, Freddie Dutton, please approach the bench. I was making sure my clothes was all right. That's a, I, w I wanted to walk, you know, right up there, and I got up there. Boy, they opened up like the Red Sea. And I walked up there, and I stood before him like this right here. And the judge stood up and reached in his pocket and got an envelope out with money in it and handed me the money. And then he reached out and shook hands and smiled. And everybody's mouth dropped open, and they said, Who in the world is Freddie Dutton? Well, let me tell you who I was. I wasn't a criminal. I didn't go in there 
as a transgressor. I went in there as his friend. I'm going someplace with this. I got in there as his friend, and, and he shook hands with me, and, and, and boy, he just made me feel real good. Let me tell you something. I'm going to stand before him one day, but I'm not going to stand there as an enemy of Christ. Uh, I'm going to stand there with the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Thank God. And he's going to say, enter thou in to the kingdom. It's our relationship when we come to him. God came to us at the cradle. He was born of a virgin. He, did, he lived a holy life. What does it mean to be saved? It means to be forgiven of all of our sins. It means redeemed. It means no condemnation. The Bible said, there is therefore now no condemnation to them in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemning sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of God might be fulfilled in those of us that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I called down home and told him I'd been saved. My family said to me, Freddie, you can't say you're saved because you don't know you're saved till you get there. You just hope you're saved. And I said, well, the Bible said I'm saved by the grace of God, and it's not presumptuous to say I know I'm going to heaven. One woman said to the preacher, I hope to see you in heaven. He said, it's up to you because I'm going. <laughs> Amen. God saved you. He gave you assurance that you're saved. Amen. Thank God. The Bible contains the revelation. Faith is the condition of it. Confession is the evidence of it. Terry and I used to go to a church down in Garland, Texas, where Dr. Jack Howells pastored a long time ago. And uh, many years before that, there was a big revival by Mordecai Helm. He's the fellow that was the evangelist preaching when Billy Graham got saved. And uh, there was a fellow there by the name of Jack Schofield that was reading, leading the music. And uh, in that big tent meeting, they said there was a man who had 20 notches on his pistol, a cowboy, and wild and mean fella. But right in the middle of the service, he stood up, and uh, the power of God was on that floor. We need that again, folks. He stood up and said, save, save, save. And Jack Schofield wrote that song, I have found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. I'd love to tell how he lifted me and what his love can do for you. Saved by his power divine, saved to new life sublime. Life is now sweet and my joy is complete for I'm saved, saved, saved. I want to say secondly, God's glory is revealed at the cross. We sing that wonderful song on a hill far away. I've been to Calvary, at the cross, kneel at the cross. That's where we find grace, found its source at the cross. That's where Satan's armor uh, was removed and death sentence is revoked. The door of heaven is opened. The fountain of salvation is unleashed. The full payment was made for our sins. Grace is the act of God whereby he is able to make us pure and morally strong. It's unmerited, un undeserved, and we're unworthy of it. Grace is a gift. Thank God for the gift of the Lord. You know, I, I used to uh, do something I don't do anymore. Uh, I'm still tempted, but I don't do it anymore. I used to slip and open my Christmas presents before Christmas. And then I'd try to act excited and surprised when I got them at Christmas. One time I opened a present, and it was an electric razor. She said, do you like it? I, I felt guilty. I'd already shaved with it at J.C. Penney parking lot. Now, I don't do that anymore. But the greatest gift that I ever got was when Christ saved me and forgave me of all of my sins and cleansed me from unrighteousness and made me a child of God by faith and let me know that I'm going to go to heaven. Thank God for His grace. A grace means redemption. Longfellow, they said, could write a poem and it'd be worth $1,000. Gates can sign his signature on a paper and it's worth millions. An artist can draw a beautiful picture and it could be worth $150,000. But God can take an old hell-bound sinner, wash him in his blood, and make him a fit subject for heaven. And that's called regeneration. Grace means access. It means by whom we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand. Thank God that we have access to the throne of grace. Amen. And God loves us and, and God cares for us. And I'm glad we can get our prayers answered and we can just come right into the presence of God. You know, one day we had a missionary come to our church. 
and uh, he preached for us, did a wonderful job. And when he got through preaching, I had forgotten. I didn't know if he was going to go somewhere else that evening for a service and could not stay. But I asked him, I said, do you have any place to go for dinner? And he said, no, we don't. Well, I said, you may come home with us. You shouldn't do that unless you tell your wife first. I forgot to tell Terry. We got over to the house when we lived over there, uh, Emma, and we got over there to the house, and uh, I'll never forget. Uh, I said, Terry, missionary and his wife's coming home with us for dinner today. She said, Freddie, what are we going to do? I've got a little bitty roast in the crock pot with uh, some potatoes and onions and carrots, and that's all we've got, and there's not enough there for four people. What are we going to do? And I said, who put something else with it? Do open some more cans or anything, you know. I've got myself in trouble. I'm really in trouble now. We sat down at the table, and I looked at that little piece of meat. It was just about that round, big enough for one person. And uh, I, I was, you know, the missionary could see we was a little bit in, embarrassed and, and uh, everything. And so uh, he said, Brother Dutton, I said, Sir, won't you go ahead and pray? He said, Before I pray, let me say this. He said, um, and he began to talk. And the Spirit of God came on that place. He said it was my son's fifth birthday. We didn't have anything in our house to eat. He was from the Philippines except rice and ketchup. And he said we didn't eat a lunch meal. We saved it so he could have a birthday meal in the evening. And he said we would take the rice and cook it, and then we'd mix the ketchup in it and make a soup. And that's what we had, and that was our meal. And it was going to be his birthday meal. So we sat down with just that meager provision, and he looked at the little boy, and he said, Son, it's your birthday today. You have the honor of praying. And the little boy bowed his head, and he started praying, and he prayed a prayer, uh, uh, Pete, like this. He said, Oh, God, I want to thank you for the uh, spaghetti. I want to thank you for the egg rolls. I want to thank you for the chicken. I want to thank you for my birthday cake. There was no birthday cake on that table. I want to thank you for the ice cream. I looked over at Terry, my wife, and she was crying. The missionary was crying. His wife was crying. And I looked around. I said, well, I might as well cry too. So I started crying. And, and we were all sitting there crying. And, and the missionary asked his little boy, he said, why did you pray that prayer? He said, because it's my birthday. And about that time, the knock came on the door. It was his church members. And they came in with a pail. And they opened the pail, and guess what they got out? Chicken and spaghetti and egg rolls. And about that time, somebody knocked on the door, and it was his brother, and he came over with a big old birthday cake and ice cream. And I looked at that little piece of meat, and I said, that's fit for a king to eat. And we sat there with tears in our eyes as we ate that meal that day and thanked God for his provisions. Let me tell you something, folks. We need to get a glimpse of his glory. He's real. A couple of years ago, I went through a very difficult time. I had a knee replaced, and it didn't work. They had to take it out and put another one in, and it got infected, and they had to take it out and put another one in. And uh, I went through about three or four knees. The doctor said, we put the Cadillac in this time. I said, what would you put in the first time, the Yugo? <laughs> but anyway, here's what happened. I had to go back up to the hospital and have a tube put down in my arm into my heart here to, f to give me intravenous medicine. And my tube had stopped up in the hospital, and the doctor said, I'm going to let you. I know you want to go home, Reverend, so we'll let you go home. But in four days, you've got to come back and get a new tube. And I said, okay, I'll come back. And I went back four days later, and on the way down State Street, I started praying. I said, Lord, would you smile on me today? I'm having, I'm having a hard time. Everything's going wrong, and I'm your child. Smile on me. God heard that prayer. I walked in that hospital. The nurse met me in the waiting room <coughs> of Grant Hospital. She said, uh, uh, come on upstairs. We're going to put you in the bed, and you have to be admitted, and we're going to remove that, and we'll put another one in, and then we have to take x-rays, and it's going to take a while. I said to her, ma'am, if it'd be all right, won't you check this one and see if it's open? She said, sir, they don't get open. Once you put them in, they get, un they get stopped up. They're stopped up. Well, I said, won't you go ahead and try it? She said, I told you, they don't get unstopped. I said, okay. She made me get in the bed, and I laid down. I thought, well, at least you could try it. And she said, okay, I'll try it. I've been a nurse 30 years, and I've never seen one get unstopped. She tried it, and guess what? It was unstopped. <laughs> she started bawling and crying. And you know what she did? She throwed me out. 
She said, get up and get out of here. And I went down there, and, and, and uh, she said, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And I wanted her to come in the emergency room or the, the waiting room and tell everybody. Terry was there. And I said, tell them what happened. It's a miracle. I've never seen it happen before. I went downstairs, and uh, you know what happened to me? I took a shouting spell right in front of Grand Hospital <laughs> with crutches. I said, Have you ever tried to shout with crutches? And my knee, you know, was like this, and I'd go across through there. Whoa, glory to God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, and about that time, a lady come up and started looking at me, and she put her pocketbook down, and I thought, what's she going to do? And she reached down there and got a $50 bill out and handed it to me and said, God bless you, sir. And I just kept on shouting. Here's the point that I want to make. The nurse said this. She said, you've got a direct line into heaven. Well, I said, we all do, bless God. The middle wall of partition was broken down. Thank God at the cross, when Jesus died there, it was broken down and the invitation was given. Come on in, hallelujah. And we can get our prayers answered today, folks. There's no use walking in darkness when we've got light. There's no use not getting our prayers answered when God's saying, go ahead and pray. Oh, grace means eternal life. Grace means character. You know, uh, I preached uh, Wednesday night, and I said, if you fall, get back up. Go at it again. We're not perfect. Let me, let me share this with you here real quick. Um, I built a, a little airplane in my basement. It was 30 foot wide, by wing, and you're supposed to jump off of a hill with it. I called my mother and I said, Mom, I built a hang glider. She said, where are you going to hang it at, honey? She thought it was something you put on the porch. I said, no, you jump off of a hill with these. Well, here's what I did. I didn't have a motor on that thing, but I went over to the airport, and my friend had built one just about like it. And he seen me, and he knew that I had built this one in my basement, and he said, uh, Reverend, come on, uh, take it for a ride. I said, goodness, no. No, I would never do that. He said, go ahead and get in it. And he talked me into sitting down in that thing. And I said, it won't hurt to sit down in it. So I sat down in it, and he said, crank it up. I said, goodness, no. No, don't do that. I'm just sitting down here make a good picture. And I sat there for a while, and I said, uh, go ahead and crank it up. It might be all right, just sit here and let it idle, you know, my hair blow back in the breeze and take a picture, take home, show Terry. And he cranked it up, and it felt so comfortable. He said, go ahead and take it out on the runway. And I said, no, goodness no, but I did. You know how you get caught up in the moment and you're not supposed to? I looked over at him. His name was Mr. Kilgore, and this is what he was doing, going like that. And that meant give it the gas, I believe. I don't know if that's what it meant or not, but I looked over and there's a handle there and I'd done that. And the next thing I know, I went down through there about 35 miles an hour and I'm 500 foot up in the air and I stop and I say, oh God, what did I do? I didn't mean to do this. You know what? They said, what'd you do? I said, I started praying. What do you think you should do? I didn't say almighty God that dwells between the cherubim whose name alone is holy. I said, oh God, <laughs> You're going to have to help me and come quick. I didn't mean to do this. I took that thing and made it go around, and I watched those people, and they're all sitting there looking up and probably thinking we better call an ambulance. And I went around, and I went around, and I said, I know one thing. i got to get her on the ground. I didn't mean to do this. You know, we all make mistakes in life, folks. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you automatically are perfect on everything. You know, thank God he gives us a chance to get back up and go at it again. And I took that thing around and I pointed it at uh, the ground and I pulled the power back a little bit and I, I, I went in on the grass strip and you know what, I greased that thing in perfect. And I did a foolish thing. I went and bought it the next day. But let me tell you something. Grace means eternal life. Do you know where else we see his glory? In the Christian. Oh, Listen. He can forgive us of our sins. And we can see his glory there. Up in Man Marion, Ohio, used to be up there, and they had a church that was uh, Pilgrim Holiness Church down on Bennett Street. Some of you might remember Pilgrim Holiness. And they had revival going on. Boy, did they have revival. And they had the windows up. And they was preaching and shouting and singing and having a great time. And uh, the woman called the police on them. 
and the police came and came in the back. It's sort of like this except the, the door's in the middle and you go up a set of steps and you come in. Now, I don't recommend this. I'm just telling you what happened. When the policeman got inside, they had two ushers back there, one on either side, and they got him by the arms and right down the aisle they went and got him to the altar. Drug him down there. Kept on preaching and having a big time. He got up and run out and got away. And the next night they kept on preaching. And I guess it's the same woman called the police department again. And they said, they're at it again over there on Bennett Street. And the police said, go, if they're bothering you, you go over there. We're not going back over there. <laughs> I wish we had some folks today that would say, we're just going to not care about what the world thinks about us. And we're going to be what God wants us to be. Amen. Let me quickly close here. I want to tell you another story. Uh, a friend of mine that's a preacher went to preach at a black church and it was a great big church he sat up on the front row and um, a lady sat down beside him and I mean hundreds and hundreds of people in there and he was the only white boy in there and she surprised him because she her name was sister Anna she looked over at him and said what you doing here white boy <laughs> he said I'm uh, the visiting preacher today she said that's wonderful did the preacher tell you how we conduct our service here? He said, no. He didn't tell me anything. He just called me here to preach. She said, let me tell you real quick what we do. She says, oh, we love to go to church here. Preacher, she said, listen, we don't get in any rush around here. We come to church and we have a good time. Said, do you know what we do? Said, we'll sing for 30 minutes. He said, really? Yeah. She said, we love to sing about Jesus. Oh, she said, we'll sing and sing and then we pray. And we don't get in any rush. And she said, that'll go on for a while. And she said, then, you know what we do? And he said, no. She said, we take the offering up, and that'll take 20 minutes. He said, 20 minutes? She said, yeah. I said, there's some men here that's got money. It belongs to God, and it takes a little while to get it. <laughs> and said, and then, you know what we do? We testify. And you know what we do then? She said, we have preaching. And she said, preacher, let me ask you a question. Do you have it? He said, what do you mean? She said, you know what I mean. Do you have it? He said, yes. She said, don't get in any rush. She said this, we're addicted to worshiping Jesus. We love to worship Jesus. The preacher got up there and, oh, the power of God was on him too. He's a man of God. And um, the pastor said, I see you talked to Sister Anna. Said, yes. Said, did she give you her testimony? He said, no. She just told me not to get in any rush that we're addicted to worship. He said, let me tell you some things about Sister Anna that she didn't say, but uh, you might want to know this. She's got cancer stage four. She didn't say that? He said, no. She said, we're addicted to worship. Don't get in any rush. Did she tell you that her two sons had been killed and her husband is dead and she's all alone? He said, no. She didn't say that. She said, we're addicted to worship. Boy, I thought about that. You know what, folks? We ought to get addicted to worship him. That's what we need once again is to see his glory. To see his glory at the cross. We don't, <clears throat> there's a lot of other things that I could mention. We see his glory in the church. This blessed church, thank God, born in Pentecostal fire, baptized in the fire of persecution, blessed with the purity of holiness, bought with the precious blood, bedecked with the white garment, betrothed to the Son of God. He's coming back for the church one day. Amen. And I'm looking forward to that. Oh, I remember one time, uh, you know, we, we just need to let God have his way. I had a wedding, and the lady that was a member of our church was marrying a very wealthy boy into a, a very wealthy family, and they had their family come up from Virginia. They had originally come from the mountains of Virginia, and we had the reception that night at our church, and after the reception, they had the reception dinner, and we all went to the reception. They had rented this big hall. They had tables, big long tables with white tablecloth, chandeliers. They had crystal and china. They had the silverware and the beautiful settings. They had the food imported, brought in, and it was just so beautiful. And you never seen such a setting. And I felt just a little bit out of place of being among those people that night. And the old country preacher was there from down in Virginia and his wife. And he was trembling a little bit because he had something wrong with him. And they looked over and they asked him, they said, Brother, would you go ahead and pray? And this is the first time this ever happened to me. He looked over at me and he said, Brother Dutton, I'm a little bit nervous tonight. Got something wrong with me. I'm shaking. Would you go ahead and pray? 
And I looked at his wife, and I could tell she felt out of place, and the preacher felt out of place, and I felt a little bit out of place. And about that time, I just looked down on that big, beautiful table, and I looked down, and I seen that nice setting, and I thought about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob when they sat down in the kingdom of God, and the marriage table is set, and the very Lamb of God and the bride is going to be there. And I started praying. I said, Lord, I just want to thank you. One day we're going to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Let me tell you what happened, folks. Something a little strange happened. First of all, it hit the old preacher. <laughs> he just quit shaking, and all of a sudden it's, whoo, glory to God. Then it hit his wife. Next thing I know, she's shouting. Next thing I know, it hits me. And I look around, everybody else is out of place, and we're feeling right at home. <laughs> That's what we need is just to let God have his way in our heart. Oh, to behold his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, to see his glory in his church. That's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life is a church that's in harmony with a big choir, a love choir music, and an old-fashioned preacher and people that love the Lord and just shout and have a good time and not care about the things of the world. That's the most beautiful thing <coughs> that I've ever seen, and I enjoy that. But we're going to see also his glory at his coming. He's coming back again. We're going to see his glory, thank God, at his coronation when he's crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I moved here from Texas. I pastored down there for several years in Dallas. And we had a Christian school, and I brought some teachers back with me, and my wife, uh, she taught school for me. We had a big uh, uh, thing getting ready, you know, and getting it all together. And we decided to change our driver's license from Texas to Ohio and make all the arrangements. Now, I'll be honest with you. I dread going into those places to get my driver's license changed. If I walk in Kroger's and there's a line right here with ten people and there's a line here with two people and I get in the line with two people, all ten goes through and I'm still standing there. That's just the way it works with me. And uh, I went over there and walked in, and, and I handed her my driver's license, and she said, Sir, you can't get driver's license here. I said, Well, my wife just got hers. She said, I don't think she did. I said, why, why can't I get driver's license? She said, You don't have your Social Security number on it. And she said, You have to have a letter from your employer. I said, Well, I'm a pastor. I don't care. You can't get your driver's license. Well, I said, My wife got hers. She said, No, she didn't. I said, Yes, she did. And uh, <clears throat> I was trying to get, you know, be humble. And uh, she said, let me go back and look. She went back and looked and said, yes, she did, but she wasn't supposed to. So I went over to the church and got, my dry, got uh, a letter typed up by my wife. She was my secretary. And it said, this is to certify that Freddie Dutton is the pastor. And I got my deacon to sign it and Terry to sign it. And I signed it and anybody else I could get to sign it. And I walked back over there with one of these little attitudes, you know. And instead of going through the big long line, at uh, the place, I walked right up in front of all them people like this here, and I laid that letter down, and all them people was looking at me, and she picked that letter up, and she read, she said, uh, uh, she read the name of the church, and she said, are you the new pastor? I said, yes, ma'am, I am. She said, I'm glad to meet you. I'm one of your members. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad God forgives, aren't you? And gets us back going straight and seeing his glory. I want to see his glory. I prayed for revival one time, Pete, and I said, God, give us revival. And, and it come on a Saturday night. And Sunday morning it was there. Sunday night it was there. And Wednesday night people was coming in church and saying, what must I do to get saved? And pretty soon more and more was coming. 124 people got saved. And boy, I'm telling you, every one of them wanted to be baptized outside. We had a baptistry. It didn't have a very good heater in it, but we had, I mean, it was warmer than the water outside, I think. And I said to them people, they all wanted to be baptized. They're from Kentucky and Virginia. And I said, why do you want to be baptized outside in the creek? They said, we won't run in water. Well, I said, let's pull the plug and turn the faucet on. And quit freezing to death. I think the angels was rejoicing. We'd seen the glory of God. We'd seen him come in power. Oh, that's what's important. And you know what? We can see him today. 2015, we can see his glory. We can see him come in a mighty way and save souls. 
I don't care who they are. Now, there's a fellow in this town, was in this town, or in Columbus. He came here from eastern Turkey to build mosque up on Broad Street. And you know what? One of our friends at a Baptist church invited him over to a revival. He said, I don't go to church. I'm a Muslim. Don't eat ham. Wore almost look like a dress, you know. And uh, he said, I don't go to that. He said, I dare you. And you don't, you don't dare those people do anything because they're not afraid of anything. And he went to church, and the old country independent Baptist preacher got up. And you know what he did? Uh, that fellow come up to the front, and he said, what do you want? He said, or what do you all think about Jesus? He said, we think he's a good man. He said, he's more than that, my friend. If he's just a good man, he's a liar. He's the son of God. About the third day, that fellow come back up there. His name is Ergen Cantor. He came back up there, and that preacher said, what do you want? He said, I want to get saved. And he got right with God. And today, that fellow's a preacher. See the glory of God. Let's bow our heads for a moment of time as the piano player comes. And I want to ask you the question tonight. Have you seen his glory lately? Has he spoke to your heart? Has he blessed your life? Oh, that you might see his glory, that you might feel his divine presence. You might be going through a battle right now or a problem. I know a lot of people do. We go through great, great difficulties at times and problems, but we've just got to trust the Lord with all of our heart. How many can say, Brother Dutton, I really, in my life, I need to see the glory of God. I need to get a glimpse of his glory and, and for him to be so real in my life that I'll be encouraged and that I'll just step out and do what he wants me to do and I'll respond to his words. Slip your hands up. God bless you all over the house. Let's stand. Our Father, we thank you for the old book. Peter saw your glory. He's never the same. He just kept going back to that telling people his testimony of how he had seen the glory of God. And, Lord, that's what we need in this year that we're living in. Our churches are being persecuted, and they're trying to take the cross down every public building, the Ten Commandments, and um, they're killing Christians in other countries. We need to be serious about walking with you, talking with you and fellowshipping with you. So you have your way in our hearts and lives tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to come down here, won't you just slip on down and have a prayer and say, I need God's help. And I'm going to commit myself to doing right, no matter what it takes. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And then you can go right back to your seat. If you can't get down, there's some seats you can sit on on the front row. And somebody be glad to pray with you. And say, I just need to get a glimpse of God's glory. I want to have revival in my home. I want to see the power of God move. We need it, folks. We need it so bad. And only if we get hungry enough will we see it come. Are you willing to seek with all of your heart? soul and mind and strength. I'm going to seek God's will for my life. And I'm going to do what He wants me to do. I look back and I can see so clearly His hand in my life when I was in Vietnam. I didn't understand everything then, but I, I look back and see all those people was praying for me. God had His hand on me. God had His hand on me, and He knew that I would respond when I got back to the States and I'm so glad that I did I'm glad that I responded will you come tonight just come on up here right now young people if you need to pray come on up and just say yes I'm going to pray and I'm just going to yield to God there is no greater work in the world than you just let God use you
Amen. If you look this way. Thank you, Brother Dutton. That was great. Um, it's been a good day. <coughs> Fantastic day. Um, Wednesday, for the bus, you can take a seat for a minute. Wednesday, we had $523 come in for the bus. Today, we had $1,159 come in for the bus. An additional $200 was given by somebody. Pastor's bringing that back with him tomorrow. So that's a grand total of 1882. And I if I'm doing the math right here, that'll be a total of 2882 with that thousand dollar match. So praise the Lord for that. Um, that's that's just fantastic. We're not uh, we're not across the finish line yet. Um, takes a little bit more than 2882 to get a bus, but we are on the way. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. <coughs> so we do praise the Lord for that. Well. That's uh, that's great. Been a good day. Uh, let's let's stand again. Let's sing. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Brother Dutton, Dutton if you and your wife will stand in the back and just uh, greet folks as they leave, uh, we sure would appreciate it. And um, all right, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. That that. It's in the chorus book there. There she is. All right. All right, let's sing it. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier in this army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Amen. You're dismissed.